Good afternoon. Welcome to our weekly livestock market update. I'm Brownfield News Anchor reporter Megan Grebner. With us is University of Missouri Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. All right, let's get into it and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, the markets here this week. Yeah, so when we start out, I think we can start on the hog side. Uh, for prices for uh, cash hogs were up about $2 for the week. Uh, when we look at the pork cutout value, it was fairly flat uh, for the week. However, when you look at pork bellies, uh, up a little more than $3 for the week, that's uh, up 28% relative to a year ago. So we are seeing some, uh, certainly some strength on the belly side. Uh, if we switch and look at the cattle side of the market, uh, feeder cattle steady to eight higher for the week. Really didn't get a lot of test on feeder calves this week, uh, just given we're kind of running out of calves off those wheat pastures. So not, not much of a run this week. On the fed cattle side, uh, mixed bag, I would say, for the week, but uh, we'll call that market steady for the most part. Uh, and that comes uh, with futures uh, uh, being down this week on cattle markets as we had a pretty tough uh, Tuesday this week in, in the futures pits. Any big surprises uh, when it comes to those markets or any of the big drivers that are contributing to, to what we've been seeing? Well, I do think when you look at what's been happening on the beef side, uh, uh, you can look at the choice beef cutout value that was up uh, $4.50 for the week and and look at uh, that being driven in large part by what rib prices went this week up uh, over $9. And I think many times we might have uh, thought coming off of Memorial Day weekend, we'd get some slowdown in terms of uh, uh, the demand for some of that higher quality grilling product out there, but uh, we've seen nothing but strong demand, I think, uh, but when you see where uh, rib prices went this week. Let's talk a little bit about quality uh, and, and how it relates to, to what's going on in the market as well. Another, uh, what, another record setting week as we take a look at that choice select spread? That's right. When, when you look at the choice select spread, uh, we, we, get, we creeped over $30 between choice and select this week. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we certainly see seasonally times where that choice select spread gets very wide, and we would expect that to be occurring right now, but uh, the, the previous peak would have came in about uh, $24, so we've added another six. It just tells me that uh, when, when you look at the beef market in particular, there's a lot of consumers that are demanding some of that higher quality beef. and. I kind of look at the demand side of this picture and go growing incomes, uh, more jobs. I think all of that's beginning to weigh in terms of that demand for higher quality beef. And, you know, you can see that, I think, when you look at uh, some of the restaurant side of things where we may see consumers buying back up in terms of where they're willing to visit uh, for that meal away from home. And, and I think that is... Uh, helpful and just again continues to remind me that uh, producers should be paying attention to the kinds of premiums that are being paid for higher quality beef and that might be something that fits into their operation. When we look at that and and can we talk about the opportunity that it does present for producers to, to take advantage of, of maybe investment in genetics or feeding programs uh, to increase their, uh, their herd quality and, and the cattle that they're marketing? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the potential bonus is, is large at times. And sometimes I think we go, well, I'm just selling my calves at the local sale barn and I don't know whether I'm claim, I'm getting into any of that uh, premium that perhaps is all being captured at the feed yard. And I, I will say that mentality is, is perhaps years old in terms of, I think there are a lot of calves today that, that sell based on reputation. And if you look at any of these, uh, local markets, there's a widespread from top to bottom, and I think better calves bring better dollars. So, so number one, talking about another uh, five to ten dollars a hundred in terms of, of feeder cattle prices for those higher end calves, I think is something that, in, in many ways, is a risk management plan that doesn't involve using futures markets. Uh, but at the same time, we can talk about building the genetic base of that cow herd, and and all of a sudden you have more equity in that herd over time. Uh, just given the kind of technology that we see out there today, being able to to embrace new technology, whether it's uh, timed AI or or some of the other technology that's available, some of the genomics technology that's available, to to me, there's some opportunity for those that want to invest uh, to to see some returns beyond. So there are costs associated with those technologies, but the return seems to me uh, when you see consumers demanding the higher quality uh, products 
might might be worth investing in for these cattle herds. We talked so long for uh, uh, about the strength in on the cattle side of the market as you look ahead and we look at the futures market. Could we be seeing maybe an indication of uh, a change in how that market is trending? Yeah. So I, th I again, I think we we certainly suspected that once we get beyond Memorial Day and things start to slow down and we might see a little more featuring on the pork side relative to to the beef side that we might see a, a, a slowdown in in where we go in cattle prices and you know I think we got a little bit of taste of that with uh, cash prices again for fed cattle this week that were kind of a little bit all over the board and and futures markets being down I, I think we are seeing folks look ahead a little bit and the idea that well maybe weights will start to to grow as we move ahead and get a little more beef into the into the market channel and so maybe we won't be quite so excited about uh, being out there uh, purchasing uh, too hard on the fed cattle side if, if we're in the packing business. The Wazi report released today pretty flat on the grain side of things. Uh, any major takeaways as we look at, at that report for the livestock producers? Well, I do think we can look at what happened uh, this uh, out of today's report for 2017 prices and say WASD, just like the rest of us, has been adjusting higher in terms of prices. If you look at fed cattle prices, uh, WASD up there 2017 midpoint $1.50 relative to uh, last month's report. They upped uh, their hog prices by $2 relative to last month's report, and they upped chicken prices by $3.50. So across the board we got lift on prices in 2017 as demand I think has been stronger uh, than, than perhaps uh, uh, even USDA would have thought and and I will say at the same time we got a little bit of revision on the production side uh, less beef production less pork production I think driven there by probably what's been the trend towards lower slaughter weights for cattle and hogs so far this year uh, when you look at all of that added together it took about a half a pound per capita off of uh, consumption in 2017. So uh, supply maybe not quite as strong as we would have thought. And again, as we've talked about stronger demand, I, I think has made even USDA go, let's, let's revise upward where we go for 2017. Monthly trade data came out this week. Um, let's talk about those numbers and some things maybe that we're uh, pulling from there. Yeah, so number one, we continue to kind of to play this same song on the trade data, thank goodness. Uh, in that we are showing April uh, exports higher. Uh, we did moderate that growth a little bit from what was pretty good pace when you look back at where we were in March. But for April, beef exports were up 13% relative to a year ago. Um, we really saw a lot of uh, countries increase uh, trade with, with the U.S. Uh, the one exception was we had Mexico down relative to a year ago. Uh, on the pork side, after what was a record-breaking March, uh, we came in with another very good April report, uh, up 8% uh, relative to a year ago. Uh, when you look at January through April on the pork side, you know we're up eight, uh, sorry, 15% uh, January through April this year relative to a year ago. That's about $2.1 billion of pork that uh, has moved on international markets this year. And, when you think about the increase in pork production that we've been seeing, it's good to see that that growth. And there on the pork side, we're seeing a number of countries who have increased uh, U.S. pork uh, imports relative to a year ago. As we look at the global competition, are, are U.S. beef and even U.S. pork, uh, are those sectors seeing more competition and, and maybe uh, increased competition from countries we don't necessarily think about on a regular basis? Yeah, I do think when you look at uh, beef here for a second, uh, we have to remind ourselves Australia has kind of been uh, in, in a tough situation with what's been dry weather and record prices in Australia. Um, I, I think that's hurt their ability to export uh, beef to a number of countries where we do compete with them on a regular basis. When you look at their total exports uh, through May this year, they're down 12.5% on beef exports relative to, to 2016. And I know we're seeing some recovery in terms of the drought situation in Australia, and I think that might put them back in the driver's seat longer term uh, in terms of at least getting uh, some increases in beef exports. So competition may get a little harder uh, as, as we move ahead from places like Australia. We've talked a lot about trade in other countries. We're still waiting to see some progress or finalization when it comes to China. Are there some niche opportunity for U.S. cattlemen um, as we look at some of those things like some of the technological or the, the, 
those types of rules that go with it? Yeah, so I think a couple of things that set there that potentially could be beneficial for folks, you know, so number one, I think we're going to end up with a product that uh, contains no beta agonists. So those that might be able to verify that, that those cattle were not fed, any type of beta agonist might uh, find some premium available if that Chinese market gets open to us. Uh, there's also going to be some source verification opportunities, I believe, as we look ahead. And, and so there might be an opportunity to, to see some added value uh, to certain cattle if we can talk about source verification and then just uh, methods of feeding that I think will be helpful as that Chinese market starts to open. And how does a producer or a U.S. cattleman figure out if that's a right move for them, if that's something that they can be successful at and take an opportunity of that premium? Yeah, so I th well, number one, I think it's pretty early in the process to know what kind of premium exists, but I always will, will remind folks all the time, what's the cost to you of uh, being able to either source verify or, or understand what they've been, uh, been fed along the way. Uh, if, if verifying uh, uh, source is, is fairly easy and costless uh, for you, that, that probably is uh, the easiest one to, to really handle. I think you're going to end up with feed yards being able to help us on in terms of uh, you know what's been the diet of those uh, those cattle and whether they've fed, been fed beta agonists. So uh, I, I don't. I, I think you just have to look at what's the cost for you to participate, and and can we trace those animals? Uh, and and that probably ends up being some type of uh, arrangement where multiple folks along the way are going to have to make sure they maintain some type of verification, and uh, that that may be where working with a particular feed yard may be helpful in in that kind of. Uh, uh, verification that we're going to need. Uh, let's switch gears, talk a little bit on the pork side of things. Fair to finish returns out this week. Um, let's take a look at those numbers. Yeah, when you look at what Iowa State re released this week for May, it was a, a month of uh, black ink for uh, pork producers. Uh, per hundred weight returns, uh, they show at $6.45. Uh, that's the second highest uh, positive we've seen since July of 2016. And uh, you know, I come back and go, you know, we probably would have started in January talking about a lot more red ink given the, the growth in uh, uh, pork supplies we expected uh, to, to come to market. So it's nice to see some uh, some positives in terms of those returns. And I will say those positives driven by and large by higher hog prices. Uh, that side of the, the ledger certainly has been what's been pulling us into to black ink for uh, the, the pork side of the industry. And while we were at uh, World Pork Expo this week, uh, the officials from uh, the Sioux City plant said that they anticipate their plant being online no later than September. So really, it's got to have some great opportunity for pork producers there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when you look at uh, what you know what we're doing from a processing side, all, all of that capacity coming on board, we got more shackle space. We need more hogs. It's all good news. And especially when we can talk about what was a very good uh, monthly export report that we got this this uh, week as well. It just reminds me, not only can we slaughter more hogs, but we're finding home for that pork as well. Let's talk a little bit about feed costs. Uh, we're getting into June. I spent a, a lot of drive time this week uh, going across Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa. And I will tell you, there's a, still a lot of bare ground and a lot of holes in the field. What does that potentially mean as we look ahead to feed cost and start talking about the quality of this 2017 crop? Yeah, I think those in the, in the futures pits this week uh, must have followed your traverse uh, across some of those I states because we did see corn futures that were higher, uh, 15 to 18 cents for the week. Uh, so some are beginning to, I think, show some concern in, in terms of where corn prices might head. Uh, we know it's still early in the growing season. Uh, we know we have a ways to go. We know we've got a lot of pretty uneven stands, I think, as we look around the country, just given how wet some parts of uh, the Corn Belt started. I, I just remind folks that uh, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be caught short right now in terms of feed supplies. Uh, this is tends to be the, the point in time during the year where we could uh, get some weather runs in those markets. Um, doesn't mean they won't come back down by the time we get to harvest, but I just wouldn't want to be short uh, in, in terms of the feed cost side because I think there's, in that particular market, more upside risk than, uh, than downside risk right now. Talked a lot about international demand and global demand for U.S. meat products as we take a look to next week. 
uh, consumer information comes out, talk a little bit and focus maybe a little on the domestic side. Yeah, that's right. We're going to get consumer confidence out at the end of next week. And I think uh, it will, again, give us another chance to confirm uh, just how strong uh, domestic demand's been for meat products this year. Anything else this week, Scott? I think you've covered the major things for this week, Megan. Have a great weekend. We will talk to you next Friday. Very good. To have our weekly livestock market update delivered to your email box every Saturday morning, go to brownfieldagnews.com and click subscribe. You can also submit comments and questions there. And for market updates twice daily, subscribe to Brownfield's Market Minute with John Perkins. Have a great weekend. I'm Megan Grebner on Brownfield.